girl, can I keep it real? Between possible ADHD, onset of perimenopause, managing these two toddlers, and trying to maintain my mental health while being somebody's wife, baby, if I never understood the importance of self-care, sis, I understand it now. So many of us are pouring from an empty cup and wondering why we feel completely depleted and defeated. If that's you and you are in need of an escape, if you are craving a break from your routine, then I want to personally invite you to join me July 14th through 28th for a totally free virtual wellness experience. For 14 days, we're going to meet at 8 p.m. Eastern every single day to experience wellness in a whole new way. I'm talking guided meditation, yoga, breath work, group therapy, grief counseling, sound bowl therapy, and so much more. If you're interested in learning human design, all about your attachment style, or you want to figure out how you can maintain your mental while managing marriage and motherhood, this is for you. Join me at the Selfish Summer Summit by tapping the link in the notes below. You deserve to get a little selfish, sis. Welcome back to another episode of the Girl Stop Playing Podcast. It's your favorite homegirl, Coriel, here to encourage you to stop playing with your potential and start working for what you want in life and in love. You already know I'm bringing you the information and the conversations to help you make the money and get the honey. You can have it all as long as you are willing to work. As always, I got a working woman in the building. We got Stormy Banks in the studio. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So I feel like you are like my social media friend (laughs) in my head. You are here in real life. I'm so excited to talk to you because what you are an expert in, I feel like the people need to know. Absolutely. But before we get into the business we got to get in your business just a little bit because I think it's super interesting kind of the way that you got into this business it came from kind of a painful situation so can we talk about it yeah absolutely so I'm glad that we're able to talk about this because a lot of people don't really understand the difficulties that come with finding your path and finding what your actual purpose is going to be in life and they'll kind of get stopped by the things that happen along the road right so mm-hmm. for me i thought i was going to be a hairstylist like i had dedicated my whole life i went to school i you know trained under the best people and i literally was doing hair for years i until... can tell did you do your own hair yes honey it looks good and i'll slap a wig on so fast it looks good <laughs> thank you yeah so once 2020 hit, you know, COVID was coming around and a lot of people were shifting, as was I. And I, New York had shut down completely for like six, eight months. And so I was like, I have to make something shake. I got to pivot. I got to find a way to keep my bills paid and make some money. So I decided to move to Tennessee, which is where one of my homegirls had a hair salon at. And I was working in her salon, saving up money, like building up capital, ended up saving up like $50,000. And it wasn't cash because it was for my tips. Um, And I was like, oh, girl, Atlanta's open. Like, we should go to Atlanta, open up a salon. I started going out there, you know, showing her on FaceTime. That's my homegirl, 10 years. Everything's great. Came back from Atlanta from the apartment that we shared together. Went to go open the door, and the locks were changed. I said, okay, maybe it's not working. I'm jingling it, but it's still not opening. So I'm calling her, calling her, calling her. No answer. Immediately, I'm already thinking, okay, my money's in there, my computer, you know, all my important documentation is in here. What would have been the purpose of this? So immediately after I didn't get a call, I just kicked the door in. I was like, we're not even going to play no games. I kicked the door in. The neighbors was like, you all right? They ended up calling the police. It was a whole fiasco, but it resulted in she had stolen the money. The money was gone. Was it just the money that was gone? Just the money. None of my other so items. she changed the locks and only stole your money. Only the money was stolen. You got to be smarter than that. Only the money. And so when the police came, you know, I was able to show them, like, hey, I live here. These are the payments I've sent to her because I wasn't on the lease because she was already there and I had just moved down. And they were like, okay, well, we got to call her to see, you know, did you steal something? Or are you telling us a fib? Whatever the case may be. When she came, 
she was like, I don't have that girl's money. I don't know where that girl's money is. And I was Not just that like, girl. that girl, that girl, the kicker though. And mm -hmm. I'm going to make an assumption. You correct me if I'm wrong. The fact that it was $50,000 cash. Mm hmm. The police probably looked at you like you're crazy, right? Like, no, I, I was able to show them the like statements that were coming in of like money that I was making through the ah, salon. So okay, they so actually you, so you believed had a paper me. trail. Yeah, so they okay. actually believed me from like some sales I was making in the salon, and they were like, "Why would you have it?" Like, they were just asking all the right questions, and they were like, "Well, we're gonna do a search of the apartment, and if we don't find anything, there's really nothing we can do because it's cash." That's... And I was just like. So they searched it. They didn't find anything. I'm guessing she had it in her car or back at the salon, whatever the case may be. But it was gone. So was there a fist fight next? She ran up on me like I stole from her. She said that was for my door. Okay. You can't make this up. Okay. <laughs> you really can't. What was literally next move? You have gotten into the apartment. The money is gone. The police say, I'm sorry, baby girl. We believe you, but there's nothing we can do. What do you do next? Depression. Depression is what came next. Did you go back home? You went back to New York? Uh, no, my mother actually was living in Tennessee. She was okay. born and raised there. So I called her over. She picked me up. First thing she was saying to me was, was 50000 to a millionaire. She mm. was like, you're going to take losses. Don't let this eat you up. But it was eating me up. And it wasn't even just the money. It was also the betrayal of a friend that I had trusted for years. You know, over a decade, I've known this girl. And just... That really set in for me, and I was just like, well, what am I going to do now? Because in my head, I had all these plans. I'm going to Atlanta. I'm opening up a salon. I'm being a hairstylist. And now I was like, now what? I haven't lived with my mother for years. You know, I'm just, I'm, I'm lost at this point. So depression is what happened next. What was your girl stop playing moment where you realized that you had, you had to pull yourself up out of the depression? Because I think a lot of times we have this knight in shining armor, princess, even if it's not a man we're expecting to save us, some circumstance, something to come along and save us. And that can happen, but a lot of times that happens once we decide to save ourselves. So what do you feel like was your decision that, okay, something's got to change, I got to figure it out? I think that decision actually came years later to say, girl, stop playing. Because what had happened is that anger had fueled me for a very long time. And I was running my business off of hurt, off of mm. pain. And that is what helped me create a lot of success because I had something to prove. I had something to get back the whole time. I'm fighting for my life, running my business and starting my business. And then Girl Stop Playing moment happened when I said, I'm, I'm tired of fighting. I'm years into this. And... I'm still having PTSD. I'm still can't build great relationships with women. I'm running my business on these fuels of anger and I want to be at peace. And then I started therapy and that was when I was like, girl, stop playing. Ooh, that is good because yeah. so many of us start businesses from not even start businesses, get degrees, go after these jobs, go after success to prove something to people, whether it's our mama, whether it's what whoever we have to prove, somebody who said we weren't going to do it, we go after it with these intentions, and then we have all of this success, but then it just doesn't feel good. Yep. It just doesn't feel fulfilling because it was rooted in, I'm going to get back at you, I'm going to mm -hmm. prove you wrong. It was rooted in something wrong. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us don't ever even stop or pause for long enough to pinpoint that or to be self-aware enough to realize that. So we just keep going, keep going. And then we end up back in depression. We end up, you know, dealing with the results of what we could have dealt with if we would have gotten to the root. And mm -hmm. so your self-awareness, I think, is just, it was paramount to you figuring out, okay, yes, this is working because I'm getting the results, but internally I'm mm -hmm. not getting to where, you know, God wants me to go or where I feel like I'm fulfilling my purpose. So what did that turn into? Because if you're making a whole lot of money, Usually, we think everything is good. If if the money is there, we equate that to I am doing well in life because I got money. So what did that look like for you to say, okay, it's still, it doesn't feel right or it's still not what it needs to be? Yeah, I mean, the money was great. I did a lot of things that I wanted to do for my family and for my community and my audience and people that I love and, and want to help. But what was happening was that I was building up a resentment for my company and 
a lot of burnout was happening. I was feeling very frustrated with just like the day to day tasks. Oh, I got another email. Oh Lord, I got to answer this email. And I'm like, this isn't even who I am for real. And I had to really start understanding and thinking about who was I before the trauma? Because what people don't understand that when trauma hits, you shift into like the survival mode of yourself and it's not your authentic self. And until you really focus on that part and realize, wow, this is not me. And I started having to dig deep for like, what are the things that need to be uncovered that I've picked up and have now embedded into who I'm acting as in order to just survive that I want to lay down, mm -hmm. that I'm ready to put, put to the side. And I really uncovered it in therapy because I, I signed up for therapy because I was like, I want to be how I used to be. I want to be me before the trauma. I want to be me before all these things happen. And she told me, she was like, that person is gone. I need you to understand that that person is gone. But the aha moment was that she said, but now you have the opportunity to create who you want to be. You have a clean slate of choosing the good and the, the parts that came after that you are in love with that you want to fulfill in your everyday life. And I was like, okay. You have the power to design your destiny, yes. regardless of what you've been through, whether it's a childhood thing, whether it's a betrayal. And this is, a lot of people, women, I'm going to say a lot of women, we think or assume like the baggage, the trauma, the emotional stuff, we always think it's related to a man. Mm -hmm. But some of these friendships, mm -hmm. these toxic relationships that we can be in with other women, the betrayals that can come from mm -hmm. it, that can literally send you into a depression so quick and, yes. and in such a way that you don't even pinpoint that that's what it is because it's not a man. Mm -hmm. It's easy to break up with somebody and blame them for, you know, why you are feeling this way or why you're going through this. But we don't give credit to the platonic relationships and the impact that they can have when they end or when they, you know, go sideways. Absolutely. So that for sure, I think you even being able to recognize that, okay, it's not just going to go away. I can't just sweep it under the rug. I got to be willing to deal with it and do something about it. Yeah. No, seriously. You know, friendship breaks up, breakups are really, really difficult in the sense of it's still somebody you trusted. It's still somebody you loved. It's still someone that you gave pertinent information to. You shared ideas with. You had all these inside jokes. And within a matter of a day, you have to let it all go. Right. And you know what I would be thinking about? It's like, it was gone in a day, but how long were you plotting on me? You was plotting. When did you come up with this plan? You know, how many conversations, how many intimate details did I share with you while you knew you was about to steal my shit? You, you know, that's that I think is where the real trust issues come in because it's like I gave a part of myself to someone who was plotting on me. Yes. Not just you made a mistake. Oh, no. But you were planning and intentional. This was like, what is it, murder versus homicide? Like, you were plotting on Absolutely. me. Absolutely. Where is this girl now? I'm I don't curious. know. I have not talked to her or seen her since, you know? And, and that's so real because after that happened, relationships with women were so hard. Even my sister. Like, with somebody I've known my whole life who's never done me wrong, I was questioning everybody. Like, I couldn't go to people's houses. Like, this right here, I couldn't even come to a secure location with, with you. I would have to, like, you know, we gotta come to my location, do this. Like, I couldn't do anything. And that, when I tell you, that also made me mad. Because I'm like... You have had this effect on me. Like, you... you I can't let you ruin me. That's right. what it comes down to. Is like right. I can't let you turn me into a version of myself that I can't even enjoy life. I can't even enjoy people. I can't even have relationships because I let you ruin me. And you that you part. don't get to do that. That part. You mess that up, but you don't get to mess up the rest. Me for everyone else. Yeah, and, Absolutely. and we don't we always preach like start a business entrepreneurship but baby if you don't work on your own personal stuff you can make all the money in the world but it will it ain't gonna be right no like for you have to be willing to work on yourself personally for sure do you have a business partner now no. do you think you could have a business partner yeah, I've invested in a lot of companies, you know, so that's a partnership that we've created and um, they go they go great, you know, they go well. So you have been able to heal to the point where it's no longer affecting you personally or professionally. You know, I wouldn't say that. I really, like, I really want. It's a journey. It's a journey. Yeah, I'm not gonna even um, say that. I'm gonna claim that, but I'm not gonna say that. That's my my you know reality right now. Is I'm still really working through a lot of different things. Um, 
Because even in my partnerships, like, I need full transparency, like, with everything I, like I do, you know, numbers, data, reports. I'm not taking anyone's word for anything, you know. I have to really know. So those are, like, some some ways that I kind of feel like I'm protecting myself but still being open to the process. I think even though your awareness to know, like, what boundaries you need in place, like, I know what I need to feel safe so that I can operate in this you know, in this relationship. Yeah. And so many people, when you are not at that level of self-awareness, that's how you end up get taken advantage of. Or Absolutely. That's how you end up in situations where your fears come true and you mm-hmm. end up with people who aren't trustworthy because you didn't have those boundaries in place. You didn't speak up for yourself. You didn't ask the right questions. So I think that at some point you're going to have to learn. And unfortunately, a lot of times it's like the hard a way. A hard way. Yeah. But you are far well I don't want to say far away you're doing something totally different though from hair yeah because you are in the grant writing space that's one of the things I know you do a lot of things mm-hmm. but I am so fascinated in this funding thing and not just fascinated you girl we need the coins right so we're not just fascinated <laughs> we're interested how did you get into like how did you transition from cosmetology into grant writing yeah I would say one of the best things that happened was that I had a lot of time to spend initially after everything happened I was at my mom's house and you know she was just coddling me and loving on me so so much that I just had time and space to do and try anything and so I was getting so deep into the web and I'm like well how can I get this money back how can I get this money back and credit wasn't great and I didn't have a lot of revenue that was coming in from just the business alone and so I'm like I can't really get a loan and I can't do my credit cards and but how can I get the money back and Crazy enough, I was online and I found like a congressional hearing one day. I'm on there watching congressional hearings. Like, I'm like, where is the money going? What's aligning? And I found out about grants that they were giving out because they were like, oh, we're giving, you know, $2 million to education this year. We're giving $300 million to agriculture. And I'm like, well, let me find out what's going on. So I dove deep, deep down in the rabbit hole and ended up finding a bunch of grants that were open that I qualify for and just started applying. I'm like, what skills do I still have, you know, that I can still utilize to get to the next level? And once I started applying for grants and I won my first one, for me, that was like, oh, wow, this is incredible. They are giving this money away. Right. And I just did it for free online for people. I was just like going live, like, hey, y'all apply for a grant with me. We were just doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it. And then after so many people won, I'm like, I might need a charge for this, you know? Yes. And then that's how my agency was born. Wow. Okay. So with the grants, what are what do you feel like are like misconceptions that people have or like little known facts about the grant process? I think people count themselves out when it comes to grants. When people hear grants, they always immediately think, oh, I can't win no grant, or oh, it takes too long, or I don't have what it takes to apply, or there's no grants for me. And I'm like, no, there actually is. So one thing I want people to start doing more is count yourself in before you count yourself out. The eligibility requirements can be as little as just U.S.-based 18 years or older sometimes, Mm -hmm. and you can actually apply for a grant, you know? And so that's, that's the biggest thing is that, there are opportunities for you available. What are some of like the craziest or unique grants that people just probably would not believe that they could qualify for? I see grants for, you know, people who are shrimp swim instructors. I see grants for people, you know, who just are farmers who want to like mow lawns. You know, I see... I see grants for literally everything that you wouldn't even imagine that, oh, my goodness, they're giving grants for this. People with red hair and have been discriminated against. I'm like, listen. Interesting. (laughs) Yes. Interesting. What is the actual, like, um, I don't want to say the time that it takes, because let me tell you, when I think about applying for a grant, I think about high school and having to write, like, a 25-page paper. And that's turns me off from the process, (laughs) which I feel like is probably intimidating for a lot of people. It's like, absolutely. I'm not a writer. Where am I going to get this information? What do you feel like are like those limiting beliefs that might be holding people back aside from, I just think I don't qualify. Yeah, that for sure. So one thing I always say is you probably already have the skill sets. Like you said, if you've ever applied for a job, you fill out a resume and you filled it out in a way that highlighted you in your best light to attract the employer to hire you so that you can then get paid for money. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's a similar process when you're filling out a grant, you're online filling out an application and 
de this depends on the type of grant as they vary quite often, but you go online, you fill out an application that deems you in a positive light and what you're doing in your business and who you are. And then you submit the application and wait to hear back if you got the, the grant or not. But the, the thing that gets people is that they give up so soon. And I know people who will put in 50 job applications, but then they'll put in one grant and get denied. And now they want to give up and not not keep going. I'm like, well, that $15 an hour, that $18 an hour was attractive enough. Why isn't this $10,000 grant to grow your own legacy attractive enough for you to keep going? Big facts. What's the root? What, what's the misconception between having or or talk about the qualifications? Because I think a lot of times people think grants and they think nonprofit only. Right. Um, you just mentioned that sometimes it could literally be just 18 and up a U.S. citizen. But what are some for entrepreneurs? What are some um, requirements that are typical for grants or does it truly just vary grant by grant? Yeah, it really does vary quite quite a bit, depending on if you're going for, like, corporate grants, government grants, state grants, local. Um, but essentially, that's a that's a great point because for-profit and nonprofit both can qualify for grants. My company is a for-profit business, and we win grants all the time. And so some of the qualifications, you, you're going to need a website. You know, so they're going to need to be able to check that you're credible. You need social platforms to be able to show social proof of what you're doing, uh, you know, in your business consistently. So, like, Instagram. Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, maybe, uh, you're also going to want to have a business bank account. They're not going to pay a business to a personal account. Mm -hmm. So like those are simple things that you can have together. And then sometimes they want, you know, a business plan. Sometimes they want, you know, um, documentations like financial statements, profit and loss sheets and things like this. But on the very basic, basic, basic level, when you're just getting started and going for like 50,000 and under grants, you really won't even need any documentation outside of what you write up in your, you know, application online. Okay, listen, I'm about to let you in on my secret weapon for the summer. It's by the Osea brand and it's an algae body oil. Now you're probably thinking algae. Yes, baby. This vegan cruelty-free, clean body oil literally leaves me with the perfect summer glow. It leaves my skin feeling soft and smooth and it has the best scent. It's like this citrusy grapefruit scent that literally my husband can't keep his hands off of me. If you want to experience this for yourself, log on to OseaMalibu.com, search for Undaria Algae Body Oil and use GS. PP as your discount code to save 10% off. That's OseaMalibu.com. You just said $50,000. Like it was like, if you're going for 500, then that's, <laughs> but I think that's a mindset shift yeah. because we are not taught how to do business, how to run business. Mm -hmm. The lessons that I have had to learn just literally the hard way, because I don't have an MBA. I didn't study business. I don't come from an entrepreneurial family. My financial literacy, I'm realizing wasn't even what it needed to be. Just mm -hmm. the lessons we have to learn the hard way. Our mindset most of the time is not, I'm going to start this business. Now, let me use other people's money to be able to do it. It's, sure. I'm going to start this business. Let me look at my savings account. I'm going to start this business. Let me cash in my 401k. I'm going to start this business. I have to have the money to be able to do that. And I think that that is a lot of times what holds our community back because we didn't count it ourselves out before we even put in an application, before we even log on. Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned having a website being one of the requirements. That leads me to, to believe that in order to qualify for a grant, it's only for existing businesses or existing programs or projects. Is that the case? Can you get yeah. a grant for just an idea or no? Yeah, absolutely. So they have a lot of like research grants uh, available. And a lot of times for those ones, they'll just ask that you have like a facility to actually do the research. But there's also smaller grants like under 5000 for even just startup costs, you know, like registering the business, getting a website. So we focus mostly on businesses that are already structured because that's when we can win more monies for them. But you can get grants even as an idea, even as a startup. You know, that might look like an accelerator program as well mm. because they want you to go through like a process of learning. Is before that like they Black just... Ambition? Yep, they okay. have an accelerator program. Yep, so, and there's multiple other ones that are out there. So typically they want you to like go through six months of learning before they just give you $150,000, which is good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which I think people should go for. But you know how we be. I don't, I just need that money. I know what to do with it. Baby, do no, you? you don't. You don't. You don't. 
And, and, and I believe they don't either. Mm. That's why we go for loans and credit cards to start our business. That already, to me, shows that you don't understand that business is a 50-50, right? At any point in time, how many businesses lost their business in COVID? Economic shifts happen every single day, but you're willing to risk your livelihood, your home, your credit report, everything to start this business, which I love that you're risking it all to bet on yourself, but do it with preparedness. So to that point, how is your credit impacted or is it impacted by a grant? Um, does it matter? Are there credit requirements? How does that part? There's no credit play? check. You There's barely personal information when you're getting on the starter level. Once we start getting to the government grants, government contracting and things of that nature, of course, they're going to look all into your background. But getting started, there's no credit check. You can have a 200 credit score and still get approved for a grant. Is that... Is that is that a thing, 200? I've never personally seen oh, okay. it, but I believe it's on it's on the, the scale. Interesting. <laughs> okay. Anything that could disqualify you from um, being able to qualify for a grant? So typically with, like, cannabis businesses or, like, alcohol-based or adult entertainment, you know, tobacco, those ones are a little bit harder to find gotcha. um, grants for. But there's, like, no high-risk industry when it comes to getting grants as long as you meet the eligibility requirements for that said grant. So you knowing what you know um, and obviously doing what you do and knowing how to write grants, probably you have a super quick process. When you say my, my company wins grants all the time, mm -hmm. When I've looked at grants, they're usually you apply in May and you don't find out until December. Is your process or do you recommend it as a best practice to get in the habit of just constantly applying for grants? Absolutely. I, we apply for one grant a day for my personal business. That's like our minimum of what we'll apply to. Because what people don't understand, we use grants as a revenue strategy. So you know how you have your business and you're looking at all these streams of income that you can provide in your business? Grants is one of those for us. If grants covers all of your operational expenses, imagine the money that you come that you that you actually make what can you do with that now where can you go how quickly can you grow if you're not paying bills so grants can literally cover all operation hiring training staff research development product inventory i'm the list goes on and on and on what are you putting on these grant applications you're literally you. saying give me this ten thousand dollars so i can run my payroll next month and they're saying Oh, yes, approved. So not exactly like that, but yeah, essentially. But what we do is a lot of people, when they write a grant or when they go for a grant, they focus on themselves, right? They're sitting there talking about themselves the whole grant. We need help because of this, and we we struggling because of that, and if I don't do this, my business is going to end. Why don't you talk about the funder and see what does the grant tour actually want? What's their mission? How do we align with you? Is this proper protocol for you to want to invest with us, right? We look at them as partners and not just a foreign entity giving out money. We're like, hey, this like they might ask a question, for instance, uh, what would you do with ten thousand dollars? And we'll say, OK, so based on, you know, what you guys have said, you you know, you want to invest in and based on past applicants, we think that the best route to align with the partnership that we're going to have would be using the $10,000 to offer jobs to underserved communities. So then we'll elaborate on that, what that will create and what that does or discriminated communities. We go based off of what they want to see in the world and we're just the vessel of doing what they want to do. Your funding is going to provide work to underserved communities. Give me this money to run my payroll. It's all about how you say it. That is what I feel like. That's where we go wrong. Yeah. Because I, you don't have the that's we don't have the language a lot of times. So that is what comes into the equation of counting ourselves out too. It's like I know what I'm doing, but I don't know how to explain it. I right. know what I'm doing, but I don't know how to paint the picture. How to you know get my message across in a way that makes sense for you to write this check. Absolutely. So I believe that this is where your company comes in. Yeah. Because you could have the skills, the idea all day, but if you don't know how to articulate articulate that mm -hmm. in a way that makes sense to a grantor, then you're just going to be filling out applications yeah. all day. You're going to get denied and then discouraged and then perhaps, you know, you might not get the funding you need or you take out a risky loan that costs so much money and now you're back at square one with debt. Okay, so I need you to tell the people how your company can assist them and talk about the process, you know, that, that you all um, work through. But before I get into that, what was I about to ask you before that? Mm. Dang. 
thing. What did I want? Oh, this is what I wanted to ask you. So you mentioned, I feel like you just gave away some some free game when you said, well, y'all are talking about yourselves in the application. Mm -hmm. This is how you need to structure it. What are a couple more of those things that you just know that like a uh, grant reviewer this will be attractive to them. Or if you say that, they are interested in this. Because a lot of this comes from, like, trial and error. Like, you yeah, have seen several winning grant applications. Mm -hmm. So what are some of those things that, you know, you know now on this side of it that people probably just didn't even think about? Yeah. So, for one, this is going to sound really simple, but grammar. I don't know why people write out their grant as if they're texting their homegirl. And I'm not saying you have to use Harvard-level language. I'm just saying be clear and spell it right so I can understand it without having to, you know, transcribe, you know, like make it easier for me. I've gone, if I'm a, if I'm the reviewer, I've gone through hundreds of applications. The last thing I want to do is sit here and get a person to help me understand and translate. So that's a, a really passed over one because it sounds really simple, but it's, it's, it's not right. Grammar is a big one. And then also the budget is so important. You have to actually know what you're going to spend the money on. Don't just say, I'm going to spend 5,000 for this and 2000 for that. Break it down and get actual numbers. So call up some people. Okay. I want to do some marketing. What kind of marketing do you want to do? You want to run ads? Do you want to hire influencers? How much do influencers cost? How many can we get with that price? You know, what does ads companies charge? How much do you have to spend a day, right? Break it down all the way because it's going to instill trust between us that you know exactly what you're going to do with the money and you're going to get this exact outcome because you've planned on what to do with the actual funding. Makes sense. Those are like simple things that you can do that will elevate your application. And then also one last thing would be when they give you 150 characters to write out your application online, don't use 200. You have 115, you have 1,500 characters typically to 2,000 to give me what I need to know about your business because all I have is this one opportunity to read about you. I'm not going to call you on the phone and say, hey, girl, uh, can you give me a little bit more detail? I'm just going to say next, right? So give them the details that they need to know so that it's not vague and they understand fully what your business is doing and you can't you can't give detailed answers when you're using like ai for mm. instance ai is going to give vague can't do it can't cheat the process can't do it mm. okay so your company has figured out a way to assist and support the process in i think like a super unique way so talk about how you all are supporting entrepreneurs in getting funding yeah, so through our process of, like, working with hundreds of entrepreneurs, what we've seen is that they just want it to be simple and they want it to be done. They don't want to have to spend another 30 hours learning something, figuring something out, or doing it themselves. So with us, it's pretty easy, right? Once a client signs up with us, we have a simple process of filling out a questionnaire that gives us the basic general information that we need to kind of start understanding your creative narrative that you want to propose. And then from there, it just takes us research, right? We go out and literally do the 60 hours of research that it takes to write one grant proposal in order to see what are the past applicants doing? What are people in your niche focusing on what are things that have been funded before sometimes we have to literally reach out to the funders previously to write in the grant to, to ask questions to like get the work done so that's the background work that we're doing it takes us about 7 to 14 business days right now and what we do is create the whole proposal so once you have the proposal you can utilize that to submit and what people don't know that's really unique is when you have one proposal if it's not like for a specific grant but if you have an overarching proposal you can use that for multiple other grant opportunities you might have to tweak, you know, a couple of keywords and phrases in the budget based on how much they're giving, but you can continuously use that. So once we get done doing the whole process of writing the grant for you, we also have an opportunity where we can help you apply to different grants as well. So we have like three different packages and people have had tons of success. We have like tons of raving reviews. Um, but one thing I do want to note is even when you work with a grant writer, it's not guaranteed that you're going to win the grant, right? So even if we go through the full process and, you know, we find the best outcomes, sometimes there's just someone else in the competition pool that just was a better fit, mm -hmm. you know? And that's just what we can't control. But we've had a great success rate, so that's rare. So do you recommend your clients learn the process or no? Like, is this yeah. one of those... Facebook ads. Mm -hmm. That was one of those things. It's like, baby, I'm not about to waste no more money trying to figure <laughs> this thing out on my own. Let me just hire somebody to do it. Is this one of those things 
in your opinion? No. I, I tell every business owner, you want to be an agile CEO. You want to be able to talk to every department on your team using their language and their lingo and understanding every process so that you can actually you know, go for the right answers or give the right direction. Because when you're hiring us, you're hiring us as a part of your team. We're not just, oh, we're going to make up some stuff to do and just do it on your behalf. No, like we need your guidance too. We don't, we got to understand your business, understand your goals, understand your needs. So until that happens, we're not going to be able to make the best decisions for you in the grant process. So when they sign up, we give them a grant master class to watch. We get on, you know, consultation calls because I want you to understand what's happening because I also don't want you calling and getting my nerves. I'm not going to lie, right? I don't want you calling being like, what's happening now? What's happening here? What's happening here? I want you to be informed so you can make informed decisions. And even if you don't choose to work with us, somebody else isn't getting over on you because they're being unethical or they're making up, oh, I can guarantee you a grant. You know, I want you to be informed. That's that's my biggest thing. Our company stands on education. All that I am thinking about while you're talking about your process and your systems and the way that your company works is the back end mm. of all of this, the team, the mm -hmm. people that it must take to support this. And my question is how? Yeah. How do you keep the machine moving? Yeah, th that that probably took us two and a half years to really get right. Um trying a lot of different automation systems. A lot of our process is automated in terms of like communication and updates with clients, a lot of the touch points. But we have departments, like a research department, where all they do is once they get the questionnaire, they're researching all the information. They're contacting everybody. They're seeing what's going on in this with this particular grant or this niche. Then we have our writing department. Once the research is done, everything is submitted to the writing department. They start curating the whole proposal. Once the writing department is done, it goes to our application department. So they're the ones who have the strategy on how to apply. And then, of course, we have customer service who goes back and forth between the clients so that our researchers and writers and application specialists can focus on their zone of genius because going back and forth with clients takes a lot of time out of a day. So it's just having departments and then having people to manage those departments because it was a time where I was the manager and I was like, I, it's not enough time in the day to answer all these questions. So... This, that takes a lot of time, a lot of trial and error. A lot of people are upset, you know, when you're figuring out business, you know, you, you, you just got to constantly be making it up to people and doing this and offering that. But that took time. But now it's solid. You got a, a well-oiled machine. Yes. Thank you, God. Girl, how do you manage these people with, I don't want to say you have trust issues, but for the sake of the question, I'm just going to say, how do you yeah. manage people with trust issues? Because that is a part that we don't usually talk about or mm -hmm. not even just talking about it a lot of times we don't even recognize it that i'm having trouble me let me just tell my own business <laughs> i'm having trouble leading this team because i i deep down have trust issues so i didn't talk about all of my plans i'm mm -hmm. not used to telling you all of the whole entire plan i only want to tell you a little bit so i can keep some of it close mm -hmm. like all of these things could be going on underneath the surface and we don't even realize right that we got trust issues and that's why this team is doing what it's doing. So how do you, knowing that you've been through this betrayal, but also knowing that you need this team to be able to scale the business and meet your goals, how do you manage that? Yeah, and this has shifted quite a bit. Um, I think leadership, learning leadership is a really big part of being a CEO, being a business owner. For me personally, um, like you were talking about earlier, one of the best things that happened to me is I know how to set boundaries. I know what I can and can't handle. So that comes up in the hiring process for me. It's like, can you adhere to this? If not, that's not even going to be the right fit. From there, it's like, are you good at what you do, right? Or do you have the skills to, to make it happen? But managing it comes from there's a part of my team that I trust and, 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 you know, know that they have that value that I can lean on them. And there's a part of my team that's just good at what they do. Not everyone gets the trusting part. Some people are just there to do their job, period. And of course, we create a fulfilling environment and we try to have like compensation packages and all these things. But I'm not trusting everybody on the team, right? Mm -hmm. I trust the people who are ahead of the teams to make sure that the things are getting done the way that they know I would I would need them to be done. In this weird space of like being a professional CEO and having a social life and being on social media, mm -hmm. do you find that 
people want to play. Like, they want to come to work, but they think it's going to be all fun because you look like you're having fun on, on Instagram. It looks like yeah. it's fun, but people don't realize there's, like, work that has to go <laughs> so that you can have fun. Yeah. How do you navigate that of, like, being a person, having a personality, people having expectations of who they think you are, how you should be based on what they've seen online? Like, how do you manage being a CEO in the social media age? You know, that is not an issue for us. Really? At, yeah, it's not an issue for us at all because, again, I I have very strict guidelines that have to be met, you know? And there's only a couple times that you have to just not do your job. And then it's like, you know, it's pretty easy for me to be like, okay, well, hey, the job's not getting done. This is what we hired you for. There's no need. Because I'm, I'm a numbers girl, too, so I'm always looking at what are you costing me and what are you bringing me back, right? So I'm always looking at that. And that kind of sets it for me, like, pretty straight and clear. This is a business built on data, built on numbers, built on satisfaction for our customers. And if you're not contributing to that, you're taking away. And it's a simple yes or no for me. I was about to ask you, because I, y'all know my business, but you don't know. <laughs> I have been working on being assertive, so that I don't have to get aggressive. Because mm. I usually just passive, 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 aggressive. Right. That does not work well. I also have trouble with tough conversations, uncomfortable conversations. I avoid conflict, all of the things. So yeah. I wanted to ask, how do you navigate tough conversations? But then you said, I'm a numbers girl. If it don't make sense, it's a yes or it's a no. Is that the mentality you have? Like, this isn't personal. I'm not in my feelings about it. The numbers don't make sense, so you got to go. Is that like your... Yeah, so perspective. I think some things that we've implemented um, is daily goals. Like, these daily goals have to be met. And they're not like, you got to make X amount of dollars. It's not like crazy goals. It's like, hey, I used to do this job too, so I actually know how much time you need to do it. So do the job. Um, daily goals, end of the day report, letting us know what was done. And then, of course, someone to go back and check that it actually really was done. And then from there... It's facts, right? We're not arguing because emotional driven things that are happening in the company or I don't feel like my needs are met or whatever. It's, hey, so on Tuesday, May 31st, 2023, you did not meet your daily goals. You missed this, this and that. This happened. Let's talk about why it happened. Oh, on June, this also happened. Now it's becoming a pattern. Unfortunately, this isn't the standard that our company holds. That's it. That's how you get it out of the emotion is... It's plain, plain and simple. I mean, the, the the numbers is here. The proof is in the pudding. I'm the same way with my clients. I'm a very hold everybody accountable person. Like, hey, girl, they'll be like, oh, I didn't get this and I didn't get that. Hey, girl, so on March 31st, uh, 2024 at 10.01 a.m., this was sent to you via this email. Can you confirm this email? Let me know. Hey, yeah, I do see. I see it now. Okay, great. Goodbye. You know, I'm just like, let's just all be accountable for what we said we was going to do. Period. That simple. Yeah. That sounds pretty simple. It really is. <laughs> and that cuts out all of that extra. Ain't no riffraff. Girl, she don't play. Can y'all tell? <laughs> she do not play. Okay. So for the people who are watching this that need some funding, which is everybody. Wait, last question. Is this only, can you only get grants for businesses? Like, can you be? Because you said like a personal? research grant. So can you just get a grant? You said red hair. It's all grants. <laughs> so not just entrepreneurs, but do you only work with entrepreneurs? Yeah, we work with uh, for-profit and non-profit companies. Okay, so mm -hmm. don't come to her with the red hair thing, okay? She's <laughs> not about to play with y'all. But if you are a for-profit or a non-profit and you are in need of funding, how can they find you and where can they um, follow you? Yeah, so my company is called Pink Print Firm, which you guys can find online at pinkprintfirm.com. And then, of course, you can always follow me on Instagram at Stormy Banks, and that's Stormy with an I and one underscore. And shoot me a DM, talk to me, whatever questions you have, we're here for you. Listen, y'all know that I am all about using this platform to put y'all in connection with people who are who they say they are and who do what they say they do. So holla at my girl. Her info is linked down below. She has the testimonials. She has the receipts. I am 
I'm here for a receipt. Hello. Okay, baby. I want to verify that you are who you say you are and you are going to do what you say you will do. So check her out. Make sure you subscribe. Follow her online and let me know when you get some funding. Okay. Thank y'all for tuning in to another episode of Girl Stop Playing. Like this video, share it with a friend, and make sure you subscribe for more. I'll catch you on the next episode.